reserve, when you open up your heart, your heart, guess what? Before you know it, you start wondering, you know, a few months back, I couldn't do this. A few months back, I wouldn't have the strength to do this. But you do have the strength because you've got that little water inside. You know, and, and learning and coming and learning what to do when the enemy attacks. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to learn what to do when the enemy attacks. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't have to tell you. You already know because you are going through it. You are being under attack. We all are. You are being under attack. And I'm going to tell you something. I uh, remember how we left off last week. We need to weigh the cost. Wait, it's going to cost you. Serving Jesus is going to cost you. If serving the Lord, serving the Father costs Jesus, it's life. What makes you think that we're going to go scot free? No, it's going to cost us. When he told the young ruler, you know, he said, came up and said, I've done everything, everything you told me to do. I tithe, I do this, I do this. I've done everything. I want to follow you. And he said, you've done everything but one thing. Said, you need to go and sell all and give away all your money, all your property. you got to give it away. Then come and follow me. What did he do? He walked away very sad. Did Jesus go run after him and beg him to come back? No. No. And we don't do that. We share the gospel. We don't force it down their throat. We don't force them. We just share it. And let him. We do the worry, but he does the increase. Not us. Our job is just to present it and let him do the increase. It's going to cost us. It's going to cost us to serve our Father. And he said it when he was talking in Matthew. And he was telling them that. And he was saying that uh, to the Pharisees and to the, to the people. He said, um, remember when I was telling you about uh, um, all the stuff that the world was going to call us, all the names that the world was going to call us, you know, all this, uh, that we were unmovable, that we were all this stuff. And, and I was telling, yes, yes, it's true. It's true. Because it is true. We're not, we are unsociable. We're not going to socialize with them. You know, if, if uh, some of you weren't here, but if, I, if you could go back and see the video, It'd be great because I can't go back because then I won't be able to finish tonight. So he said, you know, a lot of times that in itself can be a trap because we look at these people telling us all these things and calling us names and calling us all these things, and, and then we start getting, what, angry. We want to get back at them. And that's not, he, he doesn't allow that for us, allow us to do that. It's not. Let's not fall into the trap of the evil one and hold anger and resentment towards those who are against us. Jesus died for them just as he died for you and me. Dig your sandals, the armor of God, what are the sandals? Peace. Dig your sandals of peace deep into the truth, and the Holy Spirit will empower you with love and understanding you need. That's the right thing to do. Not to tell them that, not to, uh, well, I'll let you have it, one, two, three. No, no, that's not what he's wanting. He's wanting us to show the true character of God. What did he come here for? He will strengthen you to endure as a victor to the end, always doing the will of the Father, not ours. We all we, we seem to we seem to think that Jesus or the Holy Spirit is there to do our will. 
The Holy Spirit is not there to do our will. The Holy Spirit is there to lead us and help us and strengthen us and teach us to do His will. That's, that's, you know, we say, Lord, and I, I know I mentioned this to you before, and forgive me, I keep on repeating, but repeating is worth it because it, it, it puts it in you. When we, when we accept and we say, Lord, I want you to be my Lord, what are you truly saying with the word my? It's a tiny word, but what are you truly saying? I want you to be my Lord. Are you saying, I want you to be my Lord, now Now you take care of everything for me? Or I want you to be my Lord, you are over me. I will do what you ask me to do. You will be my boss, my Lord. Not you are my Lord, do whatever I want you to do. No. Be my Lord, my overseer. Be my Lord, my boss. That's what he is saying. He's not saying for us to have him as, you know, oh, I want this. Oh, oh, look, could you, look listen to our prayer. Listen to how we pray. Oh, Lord, please, I want you to, oh, Lord, please, could you please just, you know, save my son, and Lord, and also save so-and-so. And we're almost telling him what to do. No, we, we have to sit back, sit back, and start realizing who is Lord here. Who is Lord? Is it us or is it him? Right? So we need to understand that. Most of the time, the truth will cost you. It will cost you loss of family. It, I lost my family for a lot, for years. When I became a Christian, they used to make fun of me. They used to call me in Spanish, la, la, la hermanita, hallelujah. Uh, in Spanish, it means um, little hallelujah sister. The little sister, hallelujah. Yeah. And in, in mocking me, in making fun of me, yeah, it is a good title, uh, in mocking and making fun of me, and um, you could lose friends, because when you truly surrender to Father God, when you truly surrender to Him, your, your heart changes. You don't want to do your way. You don't want to do anything that displeases him. You, the first thing you want to do is, what can I do to help? What can I do to serve him? That is the true heart that has been given to the Lord. It isn't, well, I gave my heart, but I don't feel anything. I, I don't feel nothing. I feel the same. Well, you didn't give your heart. Because you, you gave your heart, there is a change. There is a change. If you don't feel nothing and you're going home and there's nothing there, well, then you didn't say it from the heart. Because when you surrender, there is later on, as you start growing, later on, as you start continuing going to church, then you're going to start understanding a little bit better. Then you're going to say, oh, I do want you to be my Lord. And that's if you go to the right church where they're teaching the Word of God. Because not every church teaches the Word of God. Not every church. You're going to lose family. Do, are you going to weigh the cost? Are you going to weigh the cost? Are you going to say, no matter what, Lord, no matter what, I'm going to serve you with all my heart. I will be willing to let go of whatever I have to let go of in order to serve you. Remember I said about my husband, Manuel, and I? I was willing to let him go. I was certain ready. You're gone, mister. You're gone. But he said, Father, because I was willing to let him go, he gave him to me. Because I was willing to let him go. Because he knows your heart. If, he, if anything pulls you away from the Lord, 
and you know your weakness, and you know that if you're going to end up back in the world, cut it off. Because it's worth you going to heaven with one or half than go to hell whole and complete. That's what I told him. You and I were married or one. You are one half, I am the other half, and we become one. But you don't want to serve the Lord. You don't want nothing to do with Him. You don't. Then you're going to be removed. Because I want to continue that way. And you're pulling me away. And I don't seem, because I was a baby Christian, I don't have the strength to fight you. I don't have an end. I'm afraid that I'm, you're going to pull me back in. And before I know it, I'm going to be back in the world. And there's nothing in the world that I like. Nothing that pulls me. No, no. The world does not give me the freedom that Jesus does. It doesn't. It doesn't. The world is nothing but a facade. It's an illusion. If the people think they're happy, oh yeah, we're happy. Oh, we're having lots of fun. And they're acting like fools. And they're not happy. They say they are, but they're not. They want you to believe they are, but they're not. Happiness. Uh, what is success in this world? What is success? Is it a lot of money? Is it a lot of material stuff? Is it a cause? Is it men? What is success in this world? You know what success in this world is? I can give it to you right now. I guarantee it because I did it. Success is knowing Jesus Christ because he is the peace giver. You have peace. You have joy. You have strength. And you always have an anchor. That is success. That no matter what happens to you, you are walking in victory. Because no matter how hot the fire is, no matter how hot it is, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is an the in You know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, hey, this too shall pass. Because nothing is permanently here on earth. Every trial, but it's all going to pass. It's the choices that you make within those trials that will determine how long you're going to be in those trials. If you can say, I'm going to, I'm going to march forward with my Jesus. He's going to take care of me. I'm going to give him everything. He is going to lead. He is going to leave. You have made him your Lord. He is not your Lord to please your ears because a lot of that's what a lot of people are doing right now. They go to this church. Oh no, oh that oh that church, no, no. They go to another church, oh that one fits me perfect. Why? Because they're hearing what they want to hear. I I and Sunday when sometimes when I get up uh, and Christina just kind of close by me, and uh, Pastor Charlie was teaching, and he teaches good, and, and uh, I got up and I go, ow, my toes hurt, my toes hurt, because I can step on my toes a lot, but I love it. I love correction. I may not like it going, but afterwards, I feel refreshed. Because why? I was going up. Track. And he said, no, 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 Miha, this way. No, I want to go this way. No, 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 Miha, this way. No, I want to go this way. Boom, boom, this way. Okay. <laughs> right? Isn't that what we do to our children when they're little? That's what we do. Don't, don't go out to the street. Ah, ta, 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 little one. Don't go out to the street. Ah, they're running out on the street. You grab them a couple. Doot, doot. They won't go out to the street again. And that's in the Word of God. So don't come up with, oh, no, that's corporal punishment. No, we already talked about that. We already taught on that, so you guys know. By the way, I do have copies of the, uh, the rights of children, but I have to go make some more.
So, okay. It is going to cost us. How much are we willing to pay to serve him? Do you think he's going to take 25%? Do you think he's going to take 50? Maybe 75? How about 99? Yeah. He wants 100. 100%. 100%. He says, don't, don't, if a, if a, if a person wants to build a tower, remember what he was talking about that? If a person wants to build a tower, and that's in Luke 14, 25, 28. If a person wants to build a tower, he says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife. Now here he was saying wife because he was speaking to men. But it also includes wives and includes husbands. And children and brothers and sisters. Yes, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And you're saying, well, no, I have to hate my mom and dad. But that's not what the word hate to us means is different than what he was suggesting here. Remember what I told you? And I'm going to read it in the, in the uh, living translation so you can understand it better. He said, great crowds were following him, and he could, because they wanted, they wanted to know what it was to, to follow him. He turned around and addressed them as follows. Anyone who wants to be my follower must love me far more than he does his own father and mother. Far more than he does his wife. Far more than he does his children. Far more than he does his brothers or sisters. Yes. More than his own life. Why more than his own life? Because we must die to self to follow him. So, he said far more, far more. Why did he say far more? Because when we love someone, we, this, let me just use a, an example here on earth. <laughs> you know, when you fall in love with your very first boyfriend and you think he's cool, and your parents say, what? And your parents say, you ain't going to see them no more. But no. Do you listen to them? No. You don't. If we, if we would have, we'd be in a lot better shape today, let me tell you. Let me tell you that. But no, we don't. We don't. He says, Mika. That boy is not good for you. That boy, no, but you don't know him. I do. You don't know him. You don't know how much he suffered. I do. He loves me. And I love him. We don't even know what love is. You know what I'm saying? We don't even know what love is. But why? Because why do we do that? Why do we even disobey our parents? Why do we? Because we think we love them more. Do you understand? We think we love them more. So he said, you must love me more, enough to let go of them if you have to. Weigh the cost. Weigh, is that understandable? Are, are you understanding? Weigh the cost. We will have to let go of father. We will have to let go. I have to let go of my friendship with my mom, with my sisters, because... They didn't want nothing to do with me in the very beginning because I was a I had been a Christian, and they didn't want so I had to let go. But I didn't care because I was so happy. I was I, I am in love still with the Father, if possible, even more, because you can't help falling in love with Him. The more you know Him, the more you love Him. Your seasons will change. You will go from a bride when you first meet him and you accept him and you make him your Lord, a bride and you want to do everything and you just go and I took the plunge and I took the plunge and I just went just head over heels. I'm still head over heels with him. The difference is that I'm more mature and older and I have walked with him longer. 
and I have settled down. Like when you first become, get married, you don't even really know your honey. You haven't lived with him. Well, I hope you haven't lived with him. But, you know, nowadays they do. Uh, uh, but, but you know what I'm saying? It takes years. Even now, if you're married and you have a honey, you still don't know. You still don't know because things change, things change, things change. And we grow and we change. And we don't act like we did when we were first married. I mean, I mean, come on now, my husband and I have 50, 50 I mean, I mean, I mean, 50, one or two, somewhere around there, <laughs> 52, or something like that. I think we'll be having 50, 53? <laughs> you know, well, anyway, past 50. Let's put it that way. Past 50. So, <laughs> you would say that we know each other pretty good. We know each other pretty good, but we still don't know each other good. And we won't, you know. So, it's going to cost us. It, I, wait, I sat down and I wait the cost. But with me, I didn't really have to. Because I was and I am in love with my feet. I love him with all my heart. I think I could give my life for him. I'm saying I think because that's the only thing I can say until they put the knife on my thing and then we'll really know, right? <laughs> but I can't lie. I'm not going to lie and say, oh, I'm going to give my life for him. I don't know yet. Nobody has ever tried to threaten me that way. So, and you guys don't know either. So, so until until we walk in those shoes, do we know? So we gotta be honest. We gotta be honest. The, the, the Father God is truth. Amen. It's very in this. Um, oh, oh yeah. He was saying. He was saying. Anyone who wants to be my follower must must love me far more than he does his father. And then, and verse twenty seven. No one can be my disciple who does not carry his own cross and follow me. What is that saying? That's saying that we're going to suffer. That's saying we're going to have trials to follow him. We're going to we're going to suffer. We're going to have trials, but we can't throw in the towel. If we throw in the towel, how are we going to mature? How are we going to grow? I'm going to tell you something. The fruit trees that are outside in the weather, they go through freezing times, they go through rain, they go through wind, they go through all the elements to produce a wonderful fruit. When the summertime and the heat, heat heats up, and that, that fruit, oh, it's how we, we go, we run inside, but the fruit hangs out in the tree. And what is it doing? It's receiving, yes, the heat. Yes, the heart, but it is turning into sugar. So when you take a bite out of that peach, mm-mm, good, right? Well, we have to suffer. We have to suffer the storms in life. And while we're suffering inside, things are changing. We're giving more compassion to others that suffer. We're, we're seeing things differently. We've been more mature. Why? Because we're going through rough times. But if you don't throw in the towel and you let him lead you and you let him guide you and you listen to what he's saying, because he's going to tell you what to do. He's, and he's going to tell you specifically what to do. Please, please, please don't take others' advice when they share their testimony and say, oh, I'm going to do that. Don't. Don't. Because that's what Father God had for them. You're different. You're a different flower altogether. Uh, a succulent and a rose, you have to put them in different spots. They don't grow the same. You have to water them differently. A succulent holds a lot of water. A rose doesn't. So you have to, you know what I'm saying? So we have to grow according to how he leads us. He feeds us. Most of you here are very mature in the Word of God, or you won't be understanding what I'm saying. But you are mature in the Word of God. And when he speaks, your spirit will verify. Because you have enough 
have his word in you to confirm. If a red flag goes up, who that? I don't care who it is. Me, Pastor Charlie, I don't care who it is. If a red flag goes up, who that? Study. Open the word. There's a lot of software, concordance, everything. There's so much that you could get. And but no matter what book you get, ask the Holy Spirit. Teach me. Show me. Guide me. Lead me. Let the word come alive to me. And he will do it. You know why? Because he's thinking. That's simple. It is the word of God is not hard. It's sinful. It's simplistic. It's beautiful. It gets light. Let it fill you. Let it fill your heart. Let it be a reservoir. Be, you know, just let all that water come in. Let all that word come in. Be filled with this word. And you will not be quick to do anything because you have this word. I don't care. How hard the trial may be, I'm not to say I don't care, I do care. But what I'm trying to say is, no matter, no matter how hard your trial, no matter how difficult, if you don't give up, you have a great reward for you. Because you don't give up. And you have a great reward waiting. Verse 28 said, but don't begin to, it says, verse 27, no one can come to, no one can be my disciple who does not carry his own cross and follow me. But don't begin until you count the cost. Did you hear what I said? Uh, oh, I'm reading Luke chapter 14. Uh-huh. And this verse that I just finished reading is, is 27. And he was talking about that being uh, following him, what it's going to cost. It says, and no one can be my disciple who does not carry his own cross and follow me. But, he's warning us, but before you want to try to carry your own cross, before you want to try to follow him, he said, but don't begin until you come for cost. Now, some of you are going to say, boy, I wish I would have heard this in the very beginning of my walk. I mean, I have walked, you know what I'm saying? Or a new baby Christian. Wow, I don't know if I want to walk. Well, consider it. That's why he has it here for what good does it do for you to say, yes, Lord, follow me, and in the middle of it, you find out that you can hack it and you get out? Oh, yeah, they were Christians. Ha, 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 they were Christians and they got out. Oh, yeah, I remember them. Those over there, they were Christians and they only lasted three months and they're out in the world. Why? Because they didn't weigh the cost. No one told them to weigh the cost. No one showed them you got to think of what's going to cost you. Are you willing to give your friends up? Are you willing to give your parents up? Are you willing to change? Are you willing to make any change that will better your walk in your faith and your journey with Christ? Are you willing to make that change? Because if you're not, hold back. Hold back. Continue going to church. Continue learning. Continue growing. Continue asking Him to give you the strength. To be able to stand like me, that chat when I bend go. Even if I go through the fire, even if you threw us, throw us in the fire, even so, we will not bow down to your statue. And even if he does save us or not save us, we still won't bow down to your statue. We have to have that kind of faith. And I'm going to tell you something. Why did um, the. Um, uh, the guy that came up and said, you know, my, um, increase my faith, but help my unbelief. Yes. And increase my 
increase my faith and have my unbelief. So, what is he really saying there? He has faith, but he wants, we need, we need it. We're not saying yet. We need him to help our unbelief because we haven't arrived. We can't all say, oh, I'm a hundred, oh, I have a hundred percent faith. Uh-uh. Be careful that you say that because he's going to prove you. He's going to prove you. He's going to say, oh, you do? Okay, let's see how, look at Job. Mm-mm, no, 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 uh-uh, we have to be careful, we have to be careful. For who would begin the construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if he has enough money to pay the bills? Remember we said that last week? Okay. Right, right. So by that he is talking about, you know, check and see, am I able, am I able to, Am I going to be able to say no to certain things? Am I going to be able to say no? And if you can, and if you don't feel that you can, that doesn't mean that you're not saying. It just means that you're going to have a hard time in your journey because you're going to be strong enough to pull through. You're going to be strong enough to to hit, but. But what Jesus says is, he says, you cannot be my disciple. So, what's the disciple? A student. A student. A disciple is a student, a follower, someone that's learning, someone that's, you know, getting, then to become apostles. But a disciple is someone that's learning and you. Those were his disciples. He got them under him. He trained them. He showed them everything. And then he let them go. And he went back to the Father. Those are his disciples. You're a disciple. You're disciples. You're being trained. You're learning. It's between you and Father God. Father God knows your heart. He knows exactly what is good for you and exactly what is good for you. Don't close the door on him. Because he may work with you in a different way because you're a different flower. Don't close the door on him. Don't throw in the towel. Investigate. Because the more you learn of him, the more you fall in love with him. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, I don't want anyone to go out of here and say, I'm not throwing the towel, forget it. If you do that, you never were in it to begin it. You never were, you never really meant it. Because if it takes this to throw you just off like that, you really, there is no substance there. So, you must persevere, you must march on. A farmer, when he goes and he plants the seed, he doesn't just leave the seed and go off and then months pass, months, no watering, no nothing, and then he comes back, oh, what is the plan? Nothing's happening. Well, you didn't water it. <laughs> you didn't fertilize it. You didn't do anything to it. What did you expect? You know what I'm saying? So, um, point four. And if you could turn to slide 66. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. Mm. Well, there's a lot showed as a fertilizer in the spiritual world, too. <laughs> oh, 66. Here's point four. Okay. Point four. Be careful what you hear. What you allow your gate. The ears are the gate. The gate. The ears are the gate to your heart. Where's your heart in your mind? Right? Remember the meaning of heart? The, the meaning? What is the meaning? Can you tell me now, somebody? What is the meaning of the heart? Uh-huh. The thoughts and the feelings of the heart. That's one of the meanings of the word heart. 
your emotions, your thoughts and emotions, the thoughts and emotions of the heart. So that's one of the meaning of heart. So he says here, what you allow in the gates, in the ears, in the gates of the ears, goes into your heart. It goes into your mind, okay? Your ears are the gates to your heart. Remember what we have learned about profanity. That was a couple of weeks back. Profanity produces what? What is profanity? You keep on, when you see people are cutting, profanity produces a certain behavior. A behavior that matches the profanity. Did you know that? Remember that we said that scientists have discovered that uh, when in Alzheimer's, they lose all their memory, and they lose it, but they will not lose the memory of profanity. They still, they cuss and cuss and cuss and cuss. That doesn't stay in there. Everything else, they lose. Memory, they don't even know how to eat anymore or nothing, but profanity stays there. Isn't that something? That's horrible. Today, people hear so much of it that they are desensitized to the effect of shock it once produced. Right? Now, everywhere, everywhere, it, you, you're desensitized. Now you hear it, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not desensitized. If I hear my neighbor or whatever, I, it, you know, it, I don't like it. I don't like it. And I hope you're the same way. I, I'm pretty sure you're the same way. I know my buddy Rose is the same way. You're the back. <laughs> That's what she does. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay, yeah, profanity produces profane behaviors. That one? Okay, let me remember what we have learned about profanity. Profanity produces profane behavior. In other words, uh, if, you, if you hear it often, then it's the, the profanity, the behavior matches the profanity. The, the, yeah, it matches the, the when you look at the people that cut the rock. And that's all you have to do. Okay. Take an honest evaluation of these questions. Now, these are the questions that I'm giving you, remember, to help you stay on track. A, what do I do when I hear foul language? That's uh, slide 67. What do I do when I hear foul language? Does it, you could, you could know you're getting desensitized because if it doesn't ha- if nothing happens to you, if you don't, like, if, then there's something wrong. Because it should cause some, something to stir in you. Because you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And when you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and you hear this stuff, it doesn't sit well with you. B, does it ever, does it even matter to me so I just pass it off? Or does it grieve my spirit to the point that I take some action? That's the true action right there. If you're outside and your neighbors are cussing, just get up, go inside. Our ears are very, very important. See, comes to us through our ear gate. Romans ten seventeen says, "So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God." So faith comes through in here. So if faith can come in here and change us from the within, so can profanity. What we listen to determines what we think, and what we think expresses who we are. Better yet, who we are. So we ask ourselves, slide C. Is my Heavenly Father pleased with what He is hearing? Why? Because He's in you. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. With what I am allowing to pass through the gates of my heart? I want to repeat that. Is my heavenly Father pleased with what I'm hearing? With what I am allowing to pass through the gates of my heart? 
Is he pleased with it? Is he pleased that you're hearing that TV? It's the time today to change. You're hearing this because he's allowing you to hear it or you wouldn't be here. And if he's allowing you to hear it, it's because he expects you to do something about it. Why? Because you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So he, did you want to say a question, Mama? Oh, so, so he's allowing you to, to see this, to hear this. What are we hearing? What are we allowing to pass through these gates and to go into and take residence in our hearts? Point five. Be careful what you allow in through your eyes. The, I just said the eyes are the windows to what? To the heart. To the soul, to the heart. Your soul lives in your mind. You know what I told you? Your soul, the soul and the mind are together. They're like a coin. And the Word of God is so sharp that it can just read it. It just, isn't that amazing? This is the Word of God. How can, how can people read the Word of God? It doesn't change them. How can you read the Word of God that is so powerful? How can you read the Word of God that is alive? How can you read the Word of God and not study what it means? Because if you don't know what you're reading and you don't understand what you're reading, there is going to be no change. You've got to understand what you're reading. You've got to understand it. We understand it and then we can apply it. If, if we're just... When I was when I was uh, teaching the children in the back and I was teaching the memory verse, I wasn't I wasn't teaching them to memorize just memorize the word. No, I will get the I will get the the verse. I would write it on the board, and then we would say it over and over and over. And then I would say, "What does this word mean?" And I would circle it. What does this word mean? And then they would they, if they didn't know it, we study it. We bring it up. Then I, and they would see it again. Okay, what does this word mean? And they would, and that's how I taught them. They needed to not memorize the scripture. They needed to know what it means. Memorization, we can memorize. I could memorize when I can't that well now. But, you know, when I was in, I could, you, you can memorize something and memorize something, but do you know what it contains? Do you know what you're saying? Do you know what it means? Why is it that so many Christians are walking about, about have beaten up spiritually? Because even though they may quote the verse and they may quote the verse, you may quote the verse and you may come to you may quote the verse inside, backwards, all the way around, but when something hits it or a trial hits it, you fall apart. Why is it? If you know the word so well, why do you fall apart when something happens? Why is it? Because you may know the word, but you haven't learned what it means. Because if you know what it means, you would apply it and know what to do. That's why it's so important to learn the word. That's why we're teaching the word. That's why he's teaching me the word, so that when something happens to me, I know exactly what's going on, and I know how to say, Father, help me. Help me. I know who to run to. I know who to call upon. I don't pick up the phone and call so-and-so and so-and-so. I pick up the phone and call them and tell them, help me pray when it's something minor for me or whatever, when, it, when it's something that I feel that I'm weak or I feel that, you know, I, I need help. Then we call a sister and a brother that we know, that we know well, and we can confide in and help them help us to pray because we need one another. We need, we're no long rangers here. We need one another. 
but in an emergency, in a crash, in an emergency, I'm not thinking, oh, you know what, uh, excuse me, Christina, I, I, um, I'm in a crash, I'm in an accident. No, I'm going to be too busy to think I'm going to call Christina. You understand what I'm saying? You're going to have to know what to do instinctively. Instinctively. And then afterwards, when you're going to, okay, put me in the prayer chain. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we know how to be, how to act instinctively when we know who we're hearing and we have his word in us. That we, when we hear it, it will confirm. It will confirm it. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, Lot. Remember Lot? He was living where? Exactly. In the midst of lewdness, he must have been horrid things to the point that his soul was being tormented. It's just vexed, and vexed means tormented, tortured. It means tortured. He stayed in Sodom, and he was the only one. Everyone else in Sodom was. I don't think there's a word to describe what that was. I don't think there's a word that is in the vocabulary in the word. It was horrendous. It was horrible. It was disgusting. It was just morbid. It was horrible. And he saw things there that they would do in the street. He would see things that just, it was so bad that his soul was because there was nothing good, nothing good in Sodom. Nothing, nothing good. Father God delivered him from his torment. There is war going on for your soul. Do you understand that? There is a war going on. And there is going on for your soul. And if we allow evil images to enter our minds, they will quickly try and become a stronghold in our hearts. If you allow images that you should not be seeing to enter into your heart, if you allow images that are not proper and you're calling yourself a Christian, you are deceiving yourself. Because a godly child will not do that if he is truly a Christian. There's a lot of Christians that have, are they addicted to porn? Many women. There were several women in a church a few years back that were addicted to porn. I discipled one. And it was very really difficult because before to become a Christian, that was what their lifestyle was. But it was very difficult for her to tear that out of her if she became a Christian. Because she said that even when she was worshiping, those, thoughts, those pictures would pop out. And those pictures would pop out. And we prayed for her and we, we, um, we just prayed and uh -huh, we prayed for her. And um, the only thing I can say is that um, she didn't last too long. She went back. So... Um, you got you, you got to weigh the cost. You got to weigh the cost. Uh, I think that I don't know. I've, I have not experienced stuff like that, so I don't know the full of it. But I hear that once you're in, it just takes a miracle of God to get out. It's an addiction. It's an addiction. So. Um, and if we allow any evil images to enter our minds, they will quickly try to become a stronghold in our hearts that only the Holy Spirit can remove. But the Holy Spirit can remove only if you do not give up. If you continue and you try and you try to continue, the images may continue, but if you just not pay attention to them and close the door for them and close the door on them, guess what? Eventually, they're going to stop appearing. Because you close the door so many times, they're just going to, okay, forget it. Keep this, go out. But it's difficult. 
it's difficult. Uh, first Peter, oh, se- uh, second Peter, I'm sorry, second Peter, chapter two. Verse 7 and 8 tells us that God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Why was he? Because he continued to see it. He continued to see it every day. If you were seeing movies, and if, I mean, even the commercials, oh my gosh. You know what? I was telling my husband, it's better not to have a TV. Oh, Mom, it's better not to have a TV. And I said, he said, he said that because, he said that because, uh, when I was, we were just beginning our Christian walk with the Lord, and, and I wanted no TV. I didn't want no TV, because I wanted to, I wanted to get into the Word, and I said, and I, and I just did it, you know, with all my heart, that's how I fired it up. I said, we had three TVs, one in the living room, one in the bedroom, and one in the study. So, and then I said, oh, and I said, Lord, break every TV. And I was walking down the hall, break every TV in the house. Woe with me, every TV broke. And it broke within a day. That Sunday, all three. And <laughs> my husband came up and said, You see what you did? You see what you did? <laughs> he wasn't a Christian yet. You see what you did? You see? It broke. It broke. And then, and, and, you know, I said, Man, I really don't like TV. You better stop that. You better not say that. You better stop that. <laughs> you know, because I tell you what. Father listens to our hearts. He listens to our hearts. And I was I was a young Christian and, and, and you know he he honors us. Even in our ignorance, he honors us. Because he loves us so. So uh, are you there? That with uh Second Peter to read? Okay. And and okay, so Jesus delivered righteous Lord. He he was righteous. Who was, what was he? He was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. That means he, he, cause he was seeing it. He was, it was right in front of him. He was seeing it. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul. I'm going to tell you something. When you have a true Christian and you have a non-believer and you have them in the same room and you're watching something, guess what? The believer is going to be tormented. Because they know the Spirit tells them. The unbeliever, no. They, they, they just, to them it comes next to us because they are their father's children, Satan. And he says, and he says that um, in verse 8, For the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and killing their lawless deeds. In slide 70, we see that, A, another question, Are the films and TV programs I've been watching giving an, giving, giving, giving an idea of my commitment to my Lord? Are you, you are the guardian of your eyes. Wow, you have a responsibility that goes into your heart. You have a responsibility to your husband, women, to stand up and say, in my house, we will serve the Lord. And this child will not come in. This house belongs to my father. And if I want his blessings to rule and reign with me, with my children, with my grandchildren, then I better you do my part. And I want no evil in this house. You can now have a door open to Satan and a door open to the Lord. 
You can't. You have to make up your mind. Which one are you going to have the door of your eyes open to? What, what, what are you going to allow in? You are the guardian of your eyes. What are you honestly allowing to flood into your mind through your eyes? That's between you and Father God. That is a question to ask. Because even commercial. So, well, I don't see anything, you know, I, 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 well, are you seeing commercial? Yes. So what do you do with a commercial? If you have to, <laughs> get up and walk away. Go to the bathroom. Huh? Yeah, mute is always, always put it on mute. And uh, the what? Yeah, if you have one, yeah, set the DDR just moving ahead. But that's between you and God. You do your soul searching. You let Father God speak to you. And remember what I'm saying, you let Father God speak to you, and I guarantee you he's going to say, uh, but he under- I understand your heart, sweetheart. You could go ahead and do it. Hmm. He's not going to say that. <laughs> no free pass to us because we're special, but we're not that special where our soul is concerned. Point six. Point six. Be careful of how you spiritually lead your family and children. Our home spouses, children, and loved ones are strategic targets for the demonic forces. In the last of the last days, the Bible forecasts a period when children will become unpersuadable, uncontrollable, unconceivable, unconvincible, or unable to be made. Do you have an um, experience that? I've seen it. Parents feel they have lost the ability to persuade, control, lead, or exercise authority over their own children. Good news, there is still time. Time to restore order on your ground. Your home is your ground. You are in charge of that. You are the guardian of your children. Even if they're married, even if they just, this thing about the, the way the world says, well, you know what, this, you leave them, you, you leave, no, no, no. If you see them doing something that is going to destroy the soul, you're just going to stand up. Well, they have to learn. No. You go over there and you are looking and you know what, you know, you know what, Mija? This is not right. And I'm just telling you this because I don't want to go and meet my father face to face and, 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 and I'm going to be like that priest, um, what's his name, that his children, his, Eli, uh, that, that they were having sex in the temple. And he didn't do anything about it. These were grown men. And no, you go to them and you tell them, this is not right, this is not of God. I need to let you know this because when I go to see my father face to face, and he's going to ask me, what did you do about it? Oh, well, there it go. That's not going to fly. It's not going to fly. If we can tell other adults that it's wrong, why can we not tell our own children? You, you think? So we have a responsibility. We must be willing to do the groundwork. If Father God can deliver law from his torture, he will deliver anyone who is willing to do what it takes to achieve victory and restore the family structure. Don't give up. You stand for your rights. It's time, ladies, that we help our husband put the foundation right again. It's time. No crack in the foundation in our home. We have to help them. They cannot do it without our help. That's why we're called the helper. Amen? Ask yourself. Ask for forgiveness of any area you may have missed the mark and when he asks something, when he asks something of you. In other words, when the Lord has asked you to do something, and you didn't do it because of fear you were going to get your children upset. You didn't do it because, well, I'm tired, I don't want to argue 
right now. I don't want to. No, ladies, this is a war. You're in a war. You're, you have responsibility. You must fight for it. If you don't fight for your loved one, who is? You must fight for those that you love. I don't care how old they are. If you have sons that, that are doing drugs or whatever, you tell them, I am praying for you and you're going to get saved. I am praying for you. You let them know that they have a praying mama, a praying grandma, a praying aunt. You let them know. Don't you, you give them advice. Don't hold back in giving them advice. Open your heart to him and his plan to empower you to resume your place in restoring your family. You gotta open your heart to him and his plan to empower you. So that's his plan. He originated, it started in, in the Garden of Eden. That's where it originated. That was his plan. Amen? Evaluate yourself. Be brutally honest with yourself. Ask these questions. Like 72. How often do I read the Bible to my children or with my family? And if you don't have one, with your husband? Together. How often do I pray with my family? How often do I take time to have family members think through difficult subjects and see what the scripture says on important subjects? These are questions to ask yourself. How often do you do it, if you do it at all? You must be willing to fight and take your decision as a leader in your family. Pray and ask for guidance from the author of life and family. He knows how to take care of things. We're going to be closing. Point seven, the last point. Be careful not to give in to the spirit of fear. Fear keeps you from doing a lot of things that we have to do. Like I said earlier, it, fear keeps you from talking to your mom and your dad. It kept me from talking to my mom and my dad. I stayed away because I knew what, how they talked about me, and I stayed away. But I didn't give up. And whenever I would go visit, to my mom would call me and say, Nika, are you going to come and see me in Spanish? And Nika, I'm going to need a uh, okay, mom. But I went there and I would talk and I would talk about the Lord. And then she started getting interested. And little by little, she started getting in. And then I ended up giving her Bible lessons. And when she left this earth, she was saved. So, but it was it, it, you have to you have to not give up. You don't give up. She had to accept me with my Lord. I could not be with her and just be her daughter. I said, Mama, he's in me. If I go in your house, he's going in with me. Wherever I go, he goes. And I think that my tenacity my, is what she likes. So be careful not to give in to the spirit of fear. Self examination, ask yourself, right? And Am I being protected in sharing God's truth and light, or am I, or am I afraid to step out because of possible retribution? Think of that. B. Do I find myself cowering in fear from what is happening in the world, or am I taking a posture that I can shine light into the darkness? To help others find truth and freedom. I know we're doing that. I know some of you are here doing that. At work. Wherever you're at. Amen. See, what am I doing to help others? How am I becoming an instrument that brings healing and restoration to those who have been hurt by our time? Remember. Remember. Remember that many people are looking for help right now, for answers, for someone to point the way. 
but fear is stopping us. Oh, they don't want to hear. Oh, should I tell them or not? No. Just be yourself. Don't be pushy. Don't be arrogant. Just be yourself and let God be God in you. In you. Mm-hmm. For someone to take them under their wing, they're looking for someone to take them under their wing and teach them to be light and salt in this dark and distasteful world. world. They are looking for you and me for help. Let's be ready. Let's speak the truth to those who are desperately searching to hear the truth. You cannot share the truth. You cannot share it if you don't have it. And in the Bible, just reading the Bible and not studying it, and not, you have some truth, but you don't have the best of the truth. It's like having almost lukewarm water. You need to know the truth of the word so you can be that light that shines in the darkness so that you can be that fresh drink that a parched heart needs. So that you so that you can be the salt, the flavor in this world. Because when they look at you, do they see arrogance? Do they see that's not good? Do they see me, 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 me? No. But if they see love, if they see compassion, they will come to you and they'll come to you for prayer. When they see when they see you that some people are talking about you and making fun of you at work because you're a Christian, but you still stand up and you still speak. And you still saying, you know, oh yes, oh yes, I go to church. Oh sure. Oh oh, oh are you a Christian? Yes. Why? Because I love my Lord. And he has saved me from a life of destruction of my own doing. That will interest them because I'm pretty sure that they're living a destructive life. So he'll give you the words to say. He'll open up the doors for you. Amen? Any questions? Any questions? Did anybody get anything out of this? Courage. 